which takes us to our third speaker. Uh, and following him, there will be a panel discussion in which uh, all three of our speakers will address uh, the questions that have been posed at the beginning of this program. The issue now, though, I would say, is how do these characteristics of Lincoln as lawyer figure uh, in explaining or how do they relate to the actual conduct of Lincoln as president with respect to these issues of personal liberty uh, and internal security? Our next speaker is, without a doubt, the foremost expert on the question of Lincoln uh, and civil liberties during the Civil War. Mark E. Neely, Jr. is McCabe Greer Professor of the History of the Civil War at Pennsylvania State University. For 20 years, he was director of the Lincoln Museum in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's author of a number of books, such as The Union Divided Party Conflict in the Civil War North, uh, a biography of Lincoln, the last best hope of Earth, uh, and of course uh, his Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Fate of Liberty, Abraham Lincoln and Civil Liberties, a 1992 publication uh, of the Oxford University Press. Uh, Professor Neely is currently working on a political history of the Civil War, but you in this audience uh, have had an opportunity to see the first edition of his most recent writing, his introduction to the keepsake that was handed out this evening, and for which we have the most deep appreciation because he prepared that under remarkably short time constraints. And we thank you very much for that, Professor Neely. Uh, Mark Neely's topic tonight is civil rights during the Civil War. What really was Lincoln's record? Professor Mark Neely. Imagining a situation near the end of that presidential uh, election summer of 1860. The nation is very tense. Uh, with the Democratic Party split, everyone assumes that the Republicans will win the election. And uh, most uh, Southerners assume that a, an administration headed by Abraham Lincoln will mean the ruin of the South, uh, a kind of institutionalized, sublimated, perhaps uh, vaguely constitutional, but perpetual John Brown raid uh, on the slave states. So let's imagine that agents from South Carolina, not afraid to precipitate a crisis that will awaken the slave states to their plight, go to New York City and under false names, take rooms in the city's landmark hotels. Be sure to get into the St. Nicholas, the leaders of the uh, plot say, uh, because for one thing, this hotel, which was six stories uh, high, and by the time of the secession crisis, uh, had, was able to, to hold probably a thousand uh, guests. Incidentally, I get all these de details about the hotels in New York uh, from that uh, engaging history of the city, Gotham, uh, written by uh, Edwin G. Burroughs and Mike Waltz. Uh, that's where I've uh, taken these things. Uh, so they would get in that hotel about 14 blocks up from City Hall. Uh, they would get into the Metropolitan on Prince Street, uh, the famous old Astor House downtown, and nine others. And if they did that, uh, they would have some 5,000 people as targets. Then employing uh, what I would call the 19th century equivalent of napalm, uh, it was called Greek fire then, uh, and as Burroughs and Wallace point out, uh, it was a, uh, a phosphorus and bisulfide of carbon mixture that ignited on contact with air. Uh, they would take this, set fire to the 13 hotels, also pick the famed, uh, some of the famed night spots and tourist attractions uh, in the city, uh, like Barnum's Museum and uh, Niblo's Theater uh, and the Winter Garden. And so the fiery conflagration uh, that results from this uh, kills 5,000 northern civilians and then ignites a rebellion in the slave states. 
Uh, this, of course, isn't how the Civil War began. Uh, but there was, there was such a plot uh, during the presidential election season four years later. It was led by Confederate, Confederate agents from Canada, uh, resourceful, uh, desperate men, mostly escaped Confederate prisoners of war. Some of them had been cavalry raiders with uh, the feared and famed John Hunt Morgan. Uh, and they timed their incendiary acts in the city for the presidential election in November. But uh, details didn't work out, so they had to delay it. And they decided to delay it until the day after Thanksgiving, another hated Yankee symbol. Uh, and well, as it turned out, the fires were miraculously easily put out. One of the captured Confederate agents, a man named Robert Kennedy, was tried uh, as a spy by a military court, uh, hanged in a federal garrison, Fort Lafayette in New York Harbor in March of 1865. Now this story is told in Nat Brandt's uh, The Man Who Tried to Burn New York, and that's uh, of where I've taken the details of the actual plot which occurred in 1864 and not in 1860. I assume that uh, you haven't gotten here tonight to make up history. I, 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 uh, but I do it because I think it requires a leap of historical imagination to understand the problems of national security under the Lincoln administration. And what I hope to do by this exercise in, in, in what I would call informed counterfactual merit, how's that? Uh, <laughs> I, what I hope is that that shows us uh, eventually the, in, that the internal security and national security measures of the Lincoln administration were responses to particular provocations. And they can never be understood without context. Alas, that was not a lesson I had learned when I wrote that book, uh, The Fate of Liberty, 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to try now to supply some of the context that that book failed to supply. Now, if we think of context, uh, then we learn that the national security measures of the Lincoln administration were responses to events of the moment. And if we were to alter those events, as I've done here with the beginning of the Civil War, then presumably we can imagine that the administration's responses would have been rather different. Well, as you know, in reality, the Civil War began uh, not with the burning of New York City, uh, but with the firing on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. It was a shocking and meaningful event, but one in which not a single person was killed, uh, and in which only military personnel were shot at. The organized military threat, though, uh, that lay behind the attack in Charleston Harbor was very obvious. And so President Lincoln took certain measures thereafter to ensure the security of the nation's uh, capital. Within two weeks of the surrender of Fort Sumter, he suspended the writ of habeas corpus, essentially to protect access routes to Washington, D.C., along a sort of corridor. Well, later that summer, when a military defeat of some magnitude occurred, the response of the Lincoln administration was different and not as measured. The Battle of Bull Run uh, and the humiliating stampede of Union troops from the battlefield, many of them all the way to Washington afterwards, on July 21st, 1861. Um, it's an image, you know, we still have in our, our, our heads, a welter of runaway uh, mules, of fleeing tem teamsters, uh, officers running uh, faster than their men were away from the field of battle, the soldiers throwing away their shiny new equipment uh, on the roads, uh, uh, congressmen and senators from Washington come down and watch the battle in their frock coats and top hats trying to stop the soldiers from, from running away, uh, uh, women in hoop skirts throwing away their picnic baskets, uh, uh, the roads jammed with private carriages. It was a, a nightmare image of unforgettable terror and humiliation for the Union. This military defeat, in which incidentally only one civilian that I, I know of was killed, a widow named uh, Mrs. Henry, who was too old to uh, flee easily and was killed in her house on the battlefield uh, in Virginia by stray shots. At any rate, uh, this battle in which uh, the Union dead numbered 625 soldiers, not 5,000 civilians, provoked a stern response from the Lincoln administration. To them, the political lesson of Bull Run was obvious. With the enemy surprisingly victorious and surprisingly threatening, you better hold on to what you've got. So, Congress first 
and what came to be called the Crittenden Resolutions, rejected any claim uh, to disturbing slavery and resolved that the war was being fought strictly for the integrity of the Union and not for any revolutionary social purposes. The president, the president didn't make any public statements on the defeat, but in private, he drafted a memorandum on strategy just two days after the Battle of Bull Run, suggested actions on several fronts, and it included some on the home front. For one thing, he insisted, quote, let Baltimore be held, as now, with a gentle but firm and certain hand, quote. Well, Baltimore was being held essentially by military authority at the time. And uh, less than two months after Lincoln had uh, drafted this memorandum, the army arrested several members of the Maryland legislature to prevent the secession of the state. As for Missouri, which was another uh, border slave state uh, within the Union and critical to the Union cause, um, a senator from Illinois, Lyman Trumbull, uh, made sure that Lincoln saw a letter from Colonel uh, John M. Palm, who was stationed in Missouri with the 14th Illinois Infantry Regiment. And Palmer had written to Trumbull and Trumbull forwarded it to the president and said that the Bull Run defeat quote, demonstrates that we have a war on our hands that is to be settled by leaden balls and cold steel. And then among other things in the letter, Palmer had urged that they throw the presses of the St. Louis, Missouri Republican, which despite its name was a Democratic newspaper, uh, that they take those and chuck them in the Mississippi River. Uh, and Lincoln forwarded this Palmer letter to John C. Fremont, who commanded the Missouri district, and within a month, Fremont declared martial law. In Missouri. Well, you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to walk you through the rest of the Civil War in this way. Uh, but I hope you can see in this the pattern of uh, action and reaction, battlefield development and response on the part of the Lincoln administration. I think that that's the way to understand a policy on national security. And so that's why I begin this with the uh, counterfactual beginning. So if Lincoln's response was to suspend the writ of habeas corpus in the Boston-Washington uh, corridor uh, after the surrender of Fort Sumter, which killed no one, uh, and if his response to surprising battlefield defeat at Bull Run with a loss of 625 soldiers killed was to reaffirm military control of uh, Baltimore uh, and uh, Maryland and to hint at uh, pitching the opposition press into the river in Missouri, uh, what would have been Lincoln's response if the Confederates had begun the war with the killing of ten times as many people as were killed at Bull Run, all of them civilians, women, and children? Well, there was actually a doctrine ready to hand uh, at the time that dealt with such a situation uh, in a way. And it had been provided during the presidential campaign of 1860 in a speech uh, by the Republican senator from Massachusetts, Charles Sumner. The speech was entitled, The Barbarism of Slavery. Now, Sumner's speech did not deal with what might happen to domestic civil liberties in the event of war. As nearly as I can tell, politicians never deal with that subject in peacetime, only when the circumstance actually arises. <laughs> But Sumner's speech offered a scheme for defining the nature of the national security challenge that would face the North, as it turned out, in a matter of months. He laid out the doctrine uh, that the South was a barbarian society whose leaders habitually used, he said, the bludgeon, the revolver, and the bowie knife, rather than freedom of speech and freedom of the press to settle disputes. Uh, and a region whose social institutions, public schools, colleges, newspapers, publishing industries, and so forth, uh, were, as he put it, all stunted. Now, the trick is that barbarism in the 19th century was not a casual word. It defined Victorian social reality to Victorians. Uh, the people of Lincoln's era thought they lived in a world uh, literally made up of civilized peoples and barbarian peoples. Uh, and so when nations 
came into conflict and made a difference what category they fell in. Civilized nations fought each other by what were called the rules of war or international law. Civilized nations fought people they regarded as barbarians without any rules at all. Civilized nations killed only the armed and organized military and naval forces of their civilized opponents. Civilized nations made no such fine distinctions in fighting so-called barbarians, killing soldiers, civilians, men, women, and children alike. Well, if somehow the administration had adopted uh, the barbarism definition of the conflict, uh, the restraints might have vanished, and in a sense, no prisoners might have been taken. If the Civil War had begun with an attack on innocent civilians, in which 5,000 New Yorkers died, that would have been a, a possible eventuality. It would have made a major difference on the battlefield and off. The use of military commissions to try southern civilians and perhaps southern soldiers taken in arms would likely have been standard practice. As it was, the Lincoln administration eventually oversaw 4,271 trials by military commission during the war, uh, almost half of them in uh, Missouri and 90% uh, of them uh, in slave states. But there would likely have been many more in an alternative uh, beginning of the war. Now, I've taken this broadly framing approach to the Lincoln administration and national security because I think it offers a solution to uh, the most difficult question that was posed to this panel tonight. Uh, uh, we are supposed to, if you look at your program, I think uh, we are supposed to assess, quote, the impact of Lincoln's legal training on national security issues during the Civil War, unquote. Those words have been going through my head for weeks. Uh, and all of us panelists have struggled with this question. But uh, in a way, I think that we've been examining individual trees and not noticing that they were sitting in a forest. I would be hard-pressed to say how Lincoln's difficulties in collect collecting debts for an Ohio businessman trying to collect them in the Logan County Circuit Court in Central <coughs> Illinois influenced Lincoln's interpretation of uh, Article 1, Section 9 of the United States Constitution, the article governing the uh, suspension of writ of habeas corpus. Um, not many practicing attorneys uh, today deal with constitutional issues after they leave law school. Uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't go to law school, and so he didn't even have that, that brief moment in the con law class. Uh, but Abraham Lincoln did have reinforced by the environment of law and justice in which he lived his daily professional life a sense that civilized nations so-called engage, even in military conflicts, by the rules of the laws of war. He said so at least once. Defending the Emancipation Proclamation from its uh, critics in a public letter uh, written in um, the autumn of 1863, uh, Lincoln explained to an old associate of his in Illinois named James C. Conkling this way, I'll quote, is there has there ever been any question that by the laws of war, property, both of enemies and friends, may be taken when needed? And is it not needed whenever taking it helps us or hurts the enemy? Armies the world over destroy enemies' property when they cannot use it, and even destroy their own to keep it from the enemy. Civilized belligerents do all in their power to help themselves or hurt the enemy except a few things regarded as barbarous or cruel. Among the exceptions are the massacre of vanquished foes and non-combatants, male and female. Now this letter, which is often called the Conkling Letter, uh, lacks the enduring fame of some uh, other Lincoln documents, but you know Lincoln crafted it very carefully. He wrote a preliminary draft, he wrote a final draft also, both of them by hand. He had a clerk in the White House copy it and then send the copy out to Conkling in Illinois to be read aloud at a political rally there that Lincoln couldn't himself attend. He sent a cover letter to Conkling instructing him how to read it out loud. And then, five days later, he decided on some revisions he wanted and inserted, uh, one of them inserted in the speech, and so he sent these pretty lengthy uh, revisions in a long telegram. 
to come in time to be read at the rally. Now, Lincoln had taken care, if you listen to that uh, letter, uh, he'd taken very uh, great care with the uh, language in it. He took care, for example, to say civilized belligerents. He didn't say civilized nations, because nationhood was not something he wanted to grant to the Confederacy. Uh, he made specific reference to the laws of war. I don't think there's any reason to think that the distinction between the rules of conflict governing civilized and barbarous uh, belligerents that he made there were any less well considered in the document. Lincoln believed in and attempted to hew to what he regarded as the laws of war uh, throughout the Civil War. That limited the use of trials by military commissions and essentially outlawed the deliberate uh, targeting of non-combatants. And didn't use that term, non-combatants, in his conflict letter. Well, I'm going to end here by going kind of very far afield. Right? Uh, there's an interesting um, new study of German atrocities in Belgium in 1914 called German Atrocities 1914, uh, a history of denial. Uh, it's written by John Horn and Alan uh, Kramer. Now, from our standpoint tonight, uh, two of the findings in this book, I think, are very significant. First, the German, German atrocities of 1914, which after World War I was over, uh, were uh, widely dismissed as allied propaganda to get America into the war, that sort of thing. Well, as it turns out, they weren't propaganda at all, but in fact, the deaths of multitudes of civilians at the hands of German army forces. Second, these deaths were not the result of uncontrollable new military technology. They were not the result of strategic bombing or high explosives, but mostly the result of firearms deliberately wielded by German soldiers, often under orders. According to Horn and Kramer, in the 1914 invasion of Belgium and France, the Germans killed 4,421 Belgian civilians and 725 French civilians in major incidents involving 10 or more citizens at a time. If we include minor incidents, they say, involving fewer than uh, uh, 10 deaths, then 5,521 Belgians were killed and 906 uh, French people, totaling then 6,427 civilians in all. Now, the German invasion began only in August, so we're talking about civilian casualties caused in fewer than five months. I doubt that 6,427 civilians were killed in all 48 months of the American Civil War uh, by deliberate targeting by Union soldiers. Nothing like that a figure. So President Lincoln and other authorities during the Civil War restrained the violence to the limits accustomed under the so-called laws of war in the Victorian era. That was surely a very great achievement for Lincoln and one for which the law had much responsibility. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the last segment of this program will be a roundtable discussion among our speakers. Uh, first, what we're going to do is, uh, my capacity as moderator, I'm going to uh, discuss with them uh, several questions which arise from the remarks that they've made. And then uh, we will open the floor uh, to some questions. For those of you who will be looking at your watches, uh, uh, the uh, program will continue to uh, uh, 7.45. Um, I'm just going to take a moment now to uh, put down this roster.
But at least since the 19th century, uh, are likely to have taken a constitutional law course. And there have been some of us uh, who continue to think about the Constitution and um, we're told about its greatness, uh, its sublime uh, stature, indeed its uh, practically religious uh, function in our society. Uh, my question for our speakers um, is this. Uh, did Lincoln take the Constitution seriously or was he agnostic as to its greatness? Anyone of our speakers would like to respond to that? Well, in, in, in my judgment, uh, Abraham Lincoln did indeed take the Constitution seriously. He did not need to know it from beginning to end in the practice of law because we pointed out his practice did not touch on constitutional issues. But as a Whig uh, and as an admirer of the Founding Fathers, Abraham Lincoln uh, appreciated the Constitution, revered the Constitution, thought it was a bulwark uh, against disorder. So that in his pre-presidential years, I think it's fair to say that Lincoln took the Constitution seriously. I can't. Uh, speak for Mark Neely here, except I heard him just now, and it seems to me he was saying that even during the war, Abraham Lincoln took the Constitution seriously. Uh, well, uh, sure, he takes the Constitution seriously, but um, I would say that uh, Lincoln's, uh, the way I like to describe it is that uh, Lincoln's first impulse when a problem arose was not to reach for the Constitution. His first impulse was to solve it. And then he looked at the Constitution to make sure the solution would pass muster. Uh, now, that is uh, perhaps not a surprising thing, uh, except it was a little more surprising in Lincoln's era, uh, which uh, had seen a decade of sort of constitutionalizing national problem uh, and a kind of fixation uh, on a constitutionalizing government. And so uh, the impulse to give a practical solution and just make sure it was constitutional uh, uh, does distinguish him some uh, from others. And um, uh, I'm pressed for a, uh, a specific example, but uh, in the initial, uh, before he suspended the Rhythm of Course for the first time, uh, they get a, a, a clerk named Tishon Coffee to look up the precedents, and, uh, and he, that's even before he does it. So he's, he's checking the Constitution, right? Well, the, the clerk does the study and says basically that, well, it looks like it's uh, the provision in the Constitution appears in the part of the Constitution governing Congress. It looks like only Congress can do it. So then we can suspend it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, those of us who uh, spend some portion of our time in the courts and the rest of our time uh, fighting with our adversaries or dealing with clients, um, hear it said uh, that uh, as advocates, um, we are actually uh, cynical about principle, uh, that uh, we are simply mouthpieces uh, who um, step forward on behalf of a paying client, preferably. Uh, or on a pro bono case, because um, uh, it seems like a good thing to uh, pursue at that time. But that we are amoral as lawyers uh, when it comes to advancing uh, principled uh, positions. Uh, you heard a little bit on this subject from uh, Stacy McDermott. I'd like to ask Stacy and our other panelists whether they believe that Lincoln uh, fit that pattern. Was Lincoln merely an immoral advocate? And I guess further, does that have some relationship to his willingness to suspend the abuse corpus and uh, allow the military commissions to operate during the Civil War? <laughs> well, I do think that Lincoln, when he would take a case, he was very much an advocate for his client. And as I mentioned with the differences in the Heard case and the other bridge case, Lincoln used the facts 
in that particular case, um, molded them and crafted them to suit his client. But I also think that Lincoln very took, took his responsibility seriously to his client, but he also, he never, I don't think, would have done something um, dishonest um, to further the position of his client. And there are numerous letters of Lincoln writing to prospective law students where he tells them it's important to be honest. Um, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, maybe Professor <coughs> Lincoln can talk to them. Well, I, I'm, I'm uh, agonizing over the, the, the notion of amorality because it kind of grates on them. And you should say yeah, it's an amorality. It's an amorality. But I would suppose that uh, at the time, Lincoln himself might have defended himself by saying that it is not a, even amoral to represent your client as diligently as possible. That in fact, in the profession of law and in an adversarial legal system, it is at least ethical, if not moral, for you to represent your client regardless of that person's <coughs> own uh, qualities uh, as rigorously as you can. So there, there's a certain, at least to me, morality or, or ethic in that notion of being a good lawyer. Well, I think I'll hide behind the college professor's uh, ultimate dodge, contextualize, contextualize, <laughs> uh, and say, uh, you know, one thing you want to, to understand this, I, I don't have an answer to this, uh, which is why I'm doing this. Uh, but, uh, I think you do need to see what the context is. And uh, I remember uh, hearing uh, uh, the, one of the founders of modern legal history, in a way, Harold Hyman, uh, uh, discuss this. And um, he remarked uh, that uh, Abraham Lincoln was a Dun & Bradstreet reporter which meant that he gave confidential information about his clients to a credit rating firm. Uh, isn't that right? Yes. Which would be a violation, I take it, of modern uh, legal ethics. But it wasn't then, apparently. Uh, and so in other words, I think one of the things we need to do is define not what our ethical universe is, but what theirs was. And it would make it easy to understand then what the ethical universe is. Well, maybe I ought to put the question a little differently. <laughs> How could a trained lawyer, experienced lawyer, a lawyer who's represented criminal defendants, not all that often, but in some pretty serious cases, suspend habeas corpus? Skillfully. <laughs> uh, uh, well, um, I I would say that that. What, for one thing, of course, you know, the Constitution allows the suspension of the particular famous courts in times of any rebellion of the nation. And the, the real question of the era was whether it was a presidential power or a congressional. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, uh, and Lincoln uh, took it as, said the Constitution didn't say, and uh, it looked to him as though the executive needed to. Uh, do it uh, in a situation uh, such as he uh, faced. Um, I don't, I think what's interesting of, about this is the uh, degree to which on all of these questions uh, Lincoln is willing to um, change his mind. Uh, and uh, I don't think necessarily always uh, to his advantage. It was mentioned earlier, for example, uh, that uh, you, you mentioned it, that uh, he uh, disallowed us from Emancipation Proclamation in Missouri, issued by John C. Vermont. And in a, in a private explanation of that, in September uh, of 1861, uh, uh, Lincoln says, quote, can't do this, it would be dictatorship. And exactly one year later, he does. Uh, and uh, is this uh, amoral or uh, uh, immoral, or uh, has he learned more, uh, studied more, and printed 
as he looked at the uh, political situation. And that, I will have to say, uh, for, for my taste, is the, uh, we, we have, if, if you're in a panel talking about Lincoln as a lawyer, you forget that Lincoln's primary occupation was not law, in my mind, but politics. Law was everything he was living. What he was interested in was politics. And so the political situation, it seems to me, at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, is, uh, uh, is this. Uh, if, if you take, uh, you know, secession comes in two ways. The first seven states are out by February uh, of uh, 1861, and then it stops. At that point, there are more slave states still in the Union than out of it. And everyone in the nation knows that the nation's fate, Jim McPherson is very good on this in his book about prior freedom, for example, uh, that, that the nation's fate hinges on what happens to those other eight states. If all eight of them go with the uh, Confederacy, this nation is finished. If none of them goes, the Confederacy will probably uh, uh, vanish pretty uh, fast. Uh, as it turns out, four went and, and uh, four didn't. But that waiting uh, and that delicate political dance uh, of uh, being sure that the government's actions don't uh, drive the what decided what will decide the fate of the Union out of the Union, that determines much of what uh, Lincoln does over uh, all of these matters, including deciding that, well, early on, it's dictatorship, and later on, after the border is secure, it's not dictatorship. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Let me throw out uh, a lawyer's hypothesis, um, a, a theory which links Lincoln's legal training with what he did uh, during the Civil War. And that is that a common lawyer, or a, a chancery lawyer, uh, learns to deal with matters case by case. It's not like on the continent where you have principles and grand theories from which you then, by some deductive method, arrive at the answer in a contested situation, but you go case by case, looking for guidance here or here or here from stare decisis from the prior uh, court decision and so forth, but you become very oriented towards context, towards the facts of a particular situation, and that helps lead you as an advocate in the direction you're going to go, and it's going to lead the court to the decision that the court's going to make. Did this kind of case-by-case -case training that Lincoln had, and that's really his training as a lawyer. I mean, he didn't go to law school, he learned on the job. Did that have any influence on how he addressed these very important legal and political issues? Well, that's a good question. I keep finding myself anticipating what my colleague Mark Eames might be saying. <laughs> But uh, I listened carefully to your remarks, Mark, which were excellent, and I, I was thinking, you certainly would describe his behavior during the Civil War with respect to the suspension of the writ habeas corpus in military tribunals as a case-by-case, -case, incremental uh, uh, succession of decisions. And, and certainly that's true of his law practice uh, as well. It was incremental. Uh, he was very comfortable, I would infer, in a common law system that, in fact, dealt with legal issues that way rather than deductively. And so uh, I think it was a comfortable uh, mode for him to operate. I guess he anticipated your, your thoughts. <laughs> I'm going to ask one other question, and then I'm going to open the floor to minutes of questions. Um, do you think, panelists, uh, that, well, let me put it this way, uh, a leading legal philosopher uh, in the New York Review of Books, uh, Professor Ronald Dworkin of uh, NYU Law School, uh, talked about the absolute necessity of balancing um, individual freedom with security in a time like this. Do you think 
that that's what Lincoln did. Did Lincoln balance freedom with security during the Civil War, or did his was his technique different? So in the famous uh, uh, letter, what's called the Corning Letter, he writes to explain uh, the arrest of uh, a Democratic politician at his trial by the military commission, Clement Blanding, uh, uh, he, uh, Lincoln says, uh, uh, not a lot of legalisms, but he says, must I uh, arrest the simple-minded soldier boy who deserves to not touch a head of the wily agitator who rates me, sir? And, you know, uh, that's a better explanation than the other one, uh, for the public purpose. Uh, and his other uh, uh, very good explanation, this is a very tough, uh, a very tough statement he makes. Uh, and he, uh, he says, uh, another, the boldness now of which he will state things, he says, you know, it's, it's more likely, I think, after the war, they'll say I arrested too few people when I was too many. He said, at one time, we had Robert E. Lee in our clutch. Uh, we had to make lists of various Confederate generals, but at one time, they might have arrested, but didn't. Uh, and, uh, and he makes a very bold statement like that. And in addition, he says, you know, that he really doesn't have any fear that the American uh, people are going to lose their love of liberty if they have to suspend a few of them in the midst of this war, and that everything will be all right. Seems to me, uh, Dick, that might invite some comments and questions from the audience. Yes, and I have to do with today. That's fine. And uh, what I'd like you to do is, when you, uh, you um, uh, ask your question, please uh, just state your name. Uh, and if you would, it would be good if you would direct your question to a particular speaker in the first instance, or speakers, uh, and then uh, any of the other speakers can also comment on the question. Yes, and speak up plenty loud. Uh, my name is Eugene Floyd. I'm a member of the association. I'll direct my question to Professor Neely. Since he just touched briefly on it, I would like to hear a good deal more about the application of military tribunals, not in the areas in rebellion, but in the North, as in the most prominent case being the Landingham case in Ohio, uh, the, uh, the uh, New York City uh, Fire bombers and the St. Albans Raiders may be more in the nature of a uh, military uh, escapade, perhaps done uh, judged by uh, courts martial. I'm not sure, but I would like very much to hear about the application of military tribunals outside the area in rebellion, and especially what opposition, if any, there was politically or judicially to these emergency measures. Do I have a tag on for that? Uh, why don't you get me that I'm I have a report? Could you comment about the use of military tribunals in the Trans-Mississippi Theater? Because if one looks at this question of the Taliban prisoners and all this, the closest to the in the Civil War I can see of an analogy to that, to, to what we dealt with in Afghanistan, is this sort of guerrilla warfare that happened in Missouri and Arkansas and the kind of legal and extra legal measures that were used. I was wondering what analogies you see in the measures used there to this, what the, Eugene just asked you the question. Sure, you don't want to address this to another panel, right? Yeah. Um, well, I guess uh, 
My approach to this problem is to take it step by step. There's a stimulus and a response, and we, and we need to look at uh, individual uh, cases and moments. So uh, the Vallandigham arrest is a, a good example. Clement Vallandigham had given a speech, uh, in a, a stump speech, uh, in Mount Vernon, Ohio in, in May of 1863, and other Democratic politicians on the platform. Uh, a, uh, a general with a, uh, a mind-bogglingly dumb record on civil liberties, uh, Ambrose Burnside, uh, had a spy there listening to the speech, uh, and uh, uh, afterwards had him arrested. Well, the, the, it seems to me that the first thing to know about this is that, I mean, who's instigating this? Uh, not the Lincoln administration. Uh, and their controls in the field are, in fact, uh, uh, rather loose. And they, you know, they they hear about it and then have to do something about it. Uh, and and that has uh, uh, much to do with it. And one other thing, uh, I would uh, uh, contextualize <laughs> again uh, uh, this in that uh, eventually, uh, uh, when Lincoln has to give a, decides he's going to give a public paper, this courting letter, explaining. Uh, the uh, arrest of uh, of Vallandigham, uh, that uh, he he is uh, uh, as uh, actually this was the, this is where I learned the lesson in context. Philip Paladin, in reviewing uh, *Fate of Liberty*, pointed out that when Lincoln wrote this very stern letter in which he said, "You know, they're going to say I arrested too few and not too many." Robert E. Lee was in Pennsylvania. Uh, and you cannot take your eye off of the uh, uh, the sort of major events of the war. So wherever Lincoln stood uh, on the Constitution, whatever, uh, uh, the, you know, his first, uh, certainly his prime uh, preoccupation uh, during the war is to win the war. Uh, and uh, and then he thought about the Constitution later. And in the case of the Landingham arrest, of course, he he uh, uh, he hears about it. Uh, later. So, well, I'm going to, that's a bit funny on the talk. So. Yes. A question to Professor Davis. In light of the fact that the Constitution contained uh, several passages expressly designed to protect the right of slave holders, uh, and the fact that it was unlawful for any state to interfere uh, with the constitutional right of slave owners to come to the North and uh, retrieve their slaves to uh, suing for their return. Uh, what led Lincoln to oppose uh, the Dred Scott decision? I mean, how did he get there? Well, with respect to the Constitution on slavery, Lincoln uh, felt it was significant that, that the Constitution did not mention slavery explicitly. And he was convinced, given the contextualizing he did about the founding fathers, that they in fact struck a devil's bargain and accepted slavery, but did not themselves endorse it. So he had no problem, it seems to me, well, he did, it was a complex issue, but he had no problem feeling that the founders had been opposed to the institution of slavery and had expected in their drafting of the Constitution that slavery would, would wither and die on its own within a certain period of time. 
what happens to, in the military arrest of civilians, uh, most of it happens uh, very close to the Confederacy. Uh, has to do with uh, cobblers who've uh, run out of shoe leather and run into Maryland to get some of the way back there. Uh, arrested, maybe tried to put in the military prisons. Uh, and they're not um, a grand acts of uh, freedom of uh, speech and criticism of the uh, administration, uh, which in uh, no particular way is uh, vitally threatened by the national security measures of the administration. Uh, the democratic press in the North, despite occasionally being hindered by mob violence uh, and a couple of uh, instances of, uh, by uh, arrest from fairly high authorities, uh, nevertheless uh, sails through uh, the war and uh, with all of the uh, bitter vituperation that uh, it, it, it can muster for the administration. So uh, I think uh, it, uh, as it turned out, it didn't um, uh, vitally threaten those uh, safeguards, those ultimate uh, safeguards of liberty. Uh, and the discussion usually comes down to the chilling effect. Uh, and on that, I will let somebody go. Uh, uh, one more question. Actually, we'll do two more right here. This is for Professor Neely. I was actually going to ask you uh, this question before you made that remark about arresting General Lee. And it goes like this. In, 19, in 1861, did the president give any thought to preventing a large number of career regular army officers who wanted to, preventing them from resigning with the obvious intent to return to the seceding states where they would take up arms against the United States, and most dramatically, did he consider putting Lee under house arrest when he refused the command? Uh, and so he could, could he have lawfully uh, done it under uh, his authority as a commander in chief and whatever regulations that were governing the regular army? Uh, so far as I know, he never considered it. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a counterfactual, and there are no documents. I mean, do you have uh, So, uh, and it shows us again what uh, I'm always at pains to say about the Civil War, uh, and that is that uh, it um, those times were very different, uh, and if the the. The sort of Victorian values that I tried to suggest uh, uh, set that world established were established by that worldview. Included notions of of honor that we might regard as foolish today, that might have covered such a situation. Right, I'm going to allow one more question, then I I'm going to have one final question. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd like to ask please you stand up. And... My name is Jordan Spritz. I'm a uh, member. Uh, I'd like to ask Professor Neely, uh, in the context of this uh, Victorian concept that uh, you fight differently with civilized persons or entities, the uh, Grant, Ulysses Grant and the campaign in Georgia, as I understand it, which is fairly well, is that this was a tactical change that implied, that, it, that included the fact that the civilian population was going to have to become an object of the uh, Union Army in order to win. This is a tactical decision. And that there was considerable destruction, uh, at least of civilian property. Uh, and does that accord, or was that a big issue in terms of what you're saying and the way uh, civil populations fight each other? Uh, the question has to do with what you mean, sure, insurance campaign in Georgia. Uh, sure. Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, uh, the, I guess if you, uh, the, the best thing I could say is to uh, look at Joseph Glathar's uh, book on uh, uh, Sherman's campaigns. Uh, he did a lot of very uh, painstaking uh, work there, which basically shows that you need to take the kind of stimulus <laughs> response, uh, careful uh, look. Uh, so that uh, the civilians, uh, the, the uh, civilians who are um, uh, killed are, are number uh, maybe uh, 150 something like that. Uh, I forgot. Can't remember. Uh, 
Uh, but anyway, it's all in Glad Park's book. And uh, the, they were generally people who were, uh, who were alleged to have shot at the soldiers from the houses. Uh, or they were, it was in the aftermath of an atrocity, they would find a Union soldier who had been shot in the back of the head under obviously execution style or something like that. And, and there are matters of, uh, of, uh, of response, immediate uh, response uh, uh, like that. And not, never a deliberate policy of targeting civ uh, civilians uh, as military uh, targets. And my, my favorite proof of this is from my, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, one of my colleagues in the Civil War uh, at Penn State, Bill Blair. And he says, you know, he says, you go back to the Civil War, whenever an invading army came into the Confederacy, what happened? The men ran away and left the women to face them. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. Uh, because the rules of war, uh, they uh, uh, governed uh, that situation. Uh, and, that, and that is, in a way, exactly what happened in Sherman's March. Uh, the three Confederate generals uh, uh, fled and left their wives in Savannah knowing uh, that they would not be threatened by the Union Army. Uh, I'd like to make one recognition and then pose this final question. The recognition is um, that uh, we've been joined by uh, one half of the uh, duo, uh, Dick Gilder, who's here tonight. Uh, it is uh, he and uh, his colleague, uh, Lou Lehrman, who are responsible for uh, the keepsake, for much support for this program, and for the activities of the Gilder Lehrman Institute. And I did want to recognize him. Let me pose this final question. Um, the whole idea of habeas corpus rid of habeas corpus, the order that the court issues, is that the imprisoned person may be wrongly imprisoned, that there is an injustice in that particular person being behind bars, and that the court, using the rule of law, will decide in a principled way whether the person is properly imprisoned. The idea of the due process of law and of uh, the procedures of jury trials or even bench trials that follow due process is that mistakes will be avoided and that uh, the person who is a wrongdoer uh, will be found to have committed the wrong and the person who is innocent will be found not guilty or at least the principles of evidence and the burden of proof will have been satisfied so that the risk will be minimized of uh, an improvident uh, finding of guilt. The question I have is, did the suspension of habeas corpus and the use of military commissions based upon our historians' study result in substantial injustice that subsequent inquiry has demonstrated uh, occurred uh, beyond the injustice that even our best efforts in an existing system uh, might result in. You're the authority, Mark. Um, well, uh, I guess, I mean, first off I would say uh, that the important thing to keep in mind is the, the stimulus to which it is a response. Uh, and so the rules that govern uh, protecting uh, the innocent uh, are surely uh, a little uh, less uh, to be ardently looked after in the face of some kind of threat. I mean, at some, at, point, at some point, the threat must get large enough, right? Uh, that the Constitution provides, uh, in fact, for the expenditure of maybe corpus in times of invasion or rebellion when the public safety requires it. And there is a, a judgment of what the public safety is. Uh, as for injustice, uh, injustice. Again, I mean, if you look at this, uh, shall we, theologically? Uh, look at Clement the Landing Hill. Uh, I, I look at specific cases. Clement Landingham, one of the things he was doing on that platform was courting arrest. Uh, 
uh, he wanted to be a, a martyr to liberty for political uh, effect for the Democratic Party. Uh, the problem, there's, it's complicated, but the problem of the Democratic Party, uh, there were several problems with the Democratic Party in the Civil War, uh, and one of them was that uh, the Constitution of the United States uh, made the, uh, a determined Republican the Commander-in-Chief for four years, and the war lasted exactly when, it began, when his term began. Now, what's a Democrat going to do about that? Uh, and it was, uh, it led to considerable frustration, uh, to say the least. Uh, and uh, uh, so if you, if you infuse in Blanningham's uh, 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 mind uh, some considerable frustration at this situation and some attempt to make as much political capital as possible, uh, now, on the abstract question of justice, I don't know, he was courting the rest. Well. We've solved the problem. <laughs> thank you very much. We thank our panelists. We thank our panelists.